together. Okay. Hi, Amanda. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I am Jesse. I oh, and there's Christy. All right. Yeah. Hello. You're good to go. Um. So I know. Uh, probably the one thing we I guess we just need to practice since it's just you two or figure out is just make sure that if you're wanting who's wanting to share slides or um that that's working out I know we've had a little bit of issues with that I know you guys have practiced and kind of talked through stuff but do you want to practice anything sure I can hi Amanda hey, how's <laughs> how, it going, are Christy? how are you good how are you doing Good. Yeah, I can go ahead and share my screen and we can run through it. So I'm controlling the slides, Jesse. And just a question. I know, um, Jesse, when when I met with Erin last week, she had said that, well, you don't, if the slides are up with a slide screen in a webinar, that the platform that you guys were using wouldn't show the, um, the little thumbnail. I'll just wait till we see people join. Hi, if you've joined us, we're just waiting for, for people to transition between sessions. So we'll start shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Summit 2021. Hope you're enjoying the sessions today. I'm Christy Slay. I'm the Senior Director of Science and Research Applications at the Sustainability Consortium. Um, if you know me or if you don't know me, I absolutely love birds. So this is a topic that is dear to my heart. And so I'm really excited for today's session. And it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Amanda Rodewall, Professor and Senior Director of Conservation Science at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Now, Cornell University is a member of the Sustainability Consortium, so we have been really excited to partner with them on a number of different projects and really figure out how we can collaborate um, on sustainability issues. And so with that, um, I really want to introduce the Lab of O, as it's called. Um, it is one of the foremost, you know, most renowned um, centers of research for all things related to birds. And so we're really lucky to have uh, Dr. Rodewall with us here today. Hi, Amanda. 
Oh, well, hi, Christy, and hi, everyone. It's um, really an honor to be here. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to, to spend some time with everyone this morning. Yeah, as you said, just a, um, just an, another word about the Cornell Lab. It's, it's a really interesting place if people aren't familiar with it, because we are this sort of scientific institute within Cornell University, as well as an education and conservation focused NGO. And so people might be familiar with like our birding tools or educational programs or and especially the citizen science projects we have like eBird. Um, and so eBird is, is um, you know, something that's actually really relevant for this particular um, session because it's one of the, it's the world's largest and now fastest accumulating biodiversity database in the world. We have we actually just passed one billion observations over the weekend, and so that's a data set that we're able to use with our scientists and analysts in order to ensure data quality and model bird populations, and then develop new ways of using birds as indicators. And so we'll be touching on some of that today, but. Yeah, just to let you know, that's sort of right in, um, you know, the wheelhouse of what the Cornell Lab is working on these days. That's wonderful. And I use eBird, so we contributed to those observations this weekend. So, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so Amanda, I want to ask you the obvious question. So what do birds and business have to do with each other? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because so often I think our focus is on how business practices are affecting birds. And that's important for sure, right? But we forget how birds can also affect and even support businesses. You know, and part of the reason is that the same working landscapes that are supporting our supply chains, well, those also are providing habitat to birds. And those birds are playing important roles um, within the ecosystems. So some species, you know, like hummingbirds, for example, they're pollinators, right? Other species are eating insects that can damage our crops or can cause forest outbreaks. Um, other species, even like the familiar um, blue jay, you can see here, they disperse seeds. I, um, other species are playing other important roles in the food chain, um, like, you know, they're scavengers or predators that are actually keeping our environments healthy and productive. You know, I think um, one great example of this really synergistic relationship between birds and businesses and kind of what can be good for both is coffee. Right? When we grow coffee under mature trees and in a form we call like shade coffee or shade grown coffee, you know, the farms can provide habitat for birds and other species like many that you're seeing here on the screen um, in front of you. Um, but they're also, those trees can also value or provide a lot of value to producers and consumers as well. So it's, you know, good for local communities. You know, trees are enriching soils, they reduce the temperatures on farms and support a healthy environment overall that benefits human and non-human health. And coffee beans that are grown under trees, they tend to be of better quality. And so they're more likely to be able to get higher prices and also taste better. And believe it or not, the birds can improve coffee yields. There have been studies that show that birds, when they're consuming the insect pests that damage coffee plants, if you, they can actually ex, um, increase coffee yields. So it's really a win-win on so many fronts. And, um, and I know, Christy, you guys have been working a lot with, with coffee in particular. I mean, is there, do you wanna share some of that work that you're doing? Yes, we have been working with a Conservation International um, with a, on a project that was funded by the Walmart Foundation. And the focus of that project has been um, focused on coffee in Colombia and Indonesia. And uh, we've been mapping, so this has been a mapping project first to figure out where the coffee is grown and where that overlaps with areas of deforestation, but also being able to identify areas that are really great for reforestation with shade grown coffee. And so having, as you described it in the pictures, the shade, um, the natural canopy of the forest and having coffee grown underneath that canopy can really benefit biodiversity for all the reasons that you said. So we're really trying to identify the regions and the areas within these two countries where it might be a great place um, to, to um, 
to have shade grown coffee and also just to have reforestation efforts as well. And so we're excited to share those results um, probably by next year, um, starting to come out this year, but definitely by next year. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and it's just people don't recognize oftentimes how, you know, coffee and shade coffee is something that can support livelihoods while at the same time actually help, you know, mitigate climate, right, and, you know, and contribute to our forest restoration goals globally. That's so great to hear what you guys are doing. Yeah. Okay. And my next question, so beyond the business aspect, um, the direct business benefits, what other kinds of economic impacts do birds have on businesses? Yeah, it's, you know, birds turn out to be really powerful economic engines. Um, and the reason is that millions of people are spending time and money on recreation that's related to birds. So that includes, you know, hunting, as well as bird watching and just generally, you know, ecotourism. Right? There are, the Fish and Wildlife Service has actually estimated that more than $150 billion are spent each year on wildlife watching and wildlife related activities that's mostly focused on birds. Right. And so people love birds. They travel to see them, you know, and this is something I think, Christy, that you and I have probably seen, you know, the benefits of, of these, you know, the tourism and bird related tourism and all of the benefits that flow from that. Um, yeah. Have you have you been to, have you taken uh, some of these bird watching trips as well? Absolutely. So we're we're um, I, I, I would look for myself in that picture there. Um, we definitely uh, go on vacation and bird watching is a huge part of of what we do when we're on vacation. And so, you know, obviously, when you travel to to bird watch, you're consuming because you're not at home. So you're purchasing consumer goods. Um, you're pur purchasing packaged foods, you're purchasing, you're eating out, you're supporting the local economy where you're traveling. And so um, it really is um, a win-win both for, for um, raising awareness and just that, that citizen science aspect of enjoying bird watching and, and documenting the birds that you see through the tools like eBird that Cornell has, but then also supporting the local economy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, partly for that reason, we're seeing more communities now and regions that are trying to establish these kinds of birding trails, right, in order to really attract um, tourists to those areas and support local businesses. I know sometimes, you know, they're actually even handing out cards to local businesses that let them know, like, we're here because of birds and the natural habitats that are being protected. Um, so people not only are spending their money in bird watching when they're traveling, but even at home, you know, um, bird watching, you know, bird seed, you know, putting out, you know, food and, and other structures to support birds is another way that they're actually, you know, providing income, you know, and revenue flow into the economy. So it's not surprising um, too that more you know there's other values related to just connecting consumers connecting with consumers through birds you know more than ever you know, people are really concerned about the impact of the products they buy on the environment right sustainability is sort of front and center of so many people's minds right now and poor stewardship of the environment can really risk brand reputation. And so an increasing number of businesses are using birds as a way to, to connect with consumers and show them that they're actually using practices and being attentive you know, to how they can support birds and other species. So one way they're doing this, of course, is through actual labeling, right, where consumers can really be assured that specific practices are being used. But there are a wide variety of ways that businesses are being creative about the way that they're using birds to connect with their consumers. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. It really is. And I love these labels, um, obviously, because because it's something that I would look for. But I think more and more consumers really want to know what's going on in the supply chains related to their food. And so labeling has become a way to directly communicate that to the consumer so that the consumer can feel better about their purchase. They know what's happening in that supply chain and they can know that they're supporting something positive. And so I really, I really like that these labels are coming on and, and being able to directly communicate to consumers in such such a um, such a direct way. Absolutely. 
And so my next question, Amanda, is how can birds play a role in monitoring the health of a supply chain? How can we use them as indicators? And this is an area where there's so much potential and, um, you know, and, and growth, growth potential, you know, as well as sort of applications, because um, birds are excellent biological indicators. So that means we can use them as a lens to actually help us to monitor, um, understand or improve the way that we're impacting the environment. You know, and in, in a lot of respects, you know, birds are really uniquely able to help us address one of the most persistent challenges that we've been facing with sustainability initiatives. And that is, how can we track our progress and ensure accountability in a cost-effective manner? I, because collecting the data that's required to do that outright can be expensive and time-consuming. But because so many people love birds, they provide a sort of different and more efficient path forward because we can rely upon community science or like crowdsourced data. Because you know, if we think about it, birds are everywhere, right? There are different species associated with different specific environments. They respond to stressors in a way that allows us to really understand by, by monitoring their numbers and distribution what's happening in the environment. And they're pretty easy to survey, right? They're pretty visible. It's relatively easy to hear them. And because so many people love birds, we can engage large numbers of people collecting that, those data. Like I mentioned, eBird, you know, this global project, we've just surpassed 1 billion observations this weekend. Right? So once we develop an indicator then um, using birds, we can actually use that to understand how supply chains are affecting environmental health, you know, at maybe farm, but also landscape level. We can understand where we're getting the best return on some of those investments and, and interventions. We can identify what needs to be adjusted and also how much progress is being made over time. Right? We're actually working with the Walmart Foundation now to develop indicators that they can use to support and track the outcomes of their pollinator policy. So again, this is a place where, where we're really able now to customize indicators for different uses. And this is done through partnerships and collaborations. That's great. Well, you know, thinking about that from that first picture, that canary in the coal mine and how they used to use birds literally as an indicator of the air quality. And now with all this technology and the science and the interest from citizens and contributing to citizen science, it's just incredible that we can develop indicators um, so, such that a farmer or a, a, a someone in the supply chain isn't out necessarily counting the birds on their on their fields, mm -hmm. but that we can use this data in in unique ways to be able to answer some of these questions and monitor the impacts of of uh, these supply chain um, goals and these supply chain programs. I think it's really fascinating. With TSC, um, we have have really focused on biodiversity, but that certainly includes birds. And so within our suite of indicators, our key performance indicators, we have a biodiversity metric. And we really ask about, um, is there a biodiversity management plan? So are you thinking about biodiversity management in your supply chains? And oftentimes that we're asking about the farm, you know, just having a plan in place and thinking it through sometimes can really lead to action and can lead to management decisions that um, are more profitable for the grower, but also uh, benefit birds. And so that birds and other wildlife, such as pollinators. And so we're, we're happy to support that metric. We've seen it improve in certain categories over time. And so it indicates to us that there is some, just by asking the question, sometimes there's some, there's a demand signal that happens and it, it helps to, to send that all the way down and say, this is important and we need to be, we need to be paying attention to this. Now, most growers definitely, most farmers that I've talked to definitely have a conservation mindset. And so they're oftentimes wanting to do things on their land that helps to benefit wildlife. And so we have um, recently been in conversations with, um, with our members to, to uh, create a, the Resilient Agriculture Accelerator Fund. So at TSC, we are leveraging this incredible network that we have of consumer goods companies and NGOs as well as retailers 
to establish a fund with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that will help to put best practices on the ground in U.S. agriculture that will benefit not only the soil and carbon sequestration and the nutrients, but also wildlife. And so we're really excited to be um, be kind of in this initial phases of that program. And so, and to be able to create a single collective fund that companies can contribute to, to really make a difference at scale. Wow, that's so exciting. What a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, congratulations on getting that established. Thanks, and I can't change slides without saying this is one of the birds I studied in graduate school. They can make That's so, great, yeah. So my next question for you is how can businesses support bird friendly practices in the supply chain? It sounds like a daunting task. Like how can they, how can a business make, um, make a difference in bird friendly practices? Yeah, there, I mean, there are a number of different options. I think one just that I want to highlight is what you mentioned earlier with just the practice of mapping and understanding your supply. So you know where you're sourcing products from and also what's happening in those regions, right? Because that really, you know, that information is power, right? And allows you, you know, the, that, the ability to be more strategic. Um, certainly, too, partnering with the lab, other NGOs, as well as um, your commodity brokers, and to try to identify how you might be able to implement biodiversity friendly practices on farms and maybe across landscapes in partnership with other landowners, and then monitoring those outcomes. You know, I think this is one, one area, too, Christy, just because they're, you know, the sustainability consortium works on this specifically, I'm sure you have a lot to add as well, um, and probably a lot more experience, you know, direct experience than I have. Yeah, I, I guess a couple of ideas I have. Um, one of the tools that I learned about was from the Nature Conservancy. And with the, the big push for renewable energy, um, there can also be some negative impacts, such as with wind turbines, um, by putting those up, um, with those big windmill farms, oftentimes they're detrimental to birds. And so they have a tool called Site Wind Right. And it's it, if you just Google it, it's there, it's a website, and you can go and you can actually see it's a very detailed map of where it is best to site wind energy projects. And so for a company who's looking to invest in renewable energy, that is a very important tool to make sure that you're doing it right. And so that is, is one resource. Another resource that we have is the, the Sustainability Consortium's Commodity Mapping Tool. And so that is free for our members. It's really a benefit of your membership. And that is a tool we're gonna to be talking about a little bit more tomorrow um, in our session. So if you wanna join that session, you can learn more about it, but it is a tool that takes very limited information, whatever you have about your commodities, and we're able to model your supply chain and overlay the different types of risks, including biodiversity. We can even look at birds specifically. And so um, that is another tool that we have um, that we encourage our members to use. That's great. So lastly, my last question. So what can we learn by listening to birds to ensure resilient supply chains into the future? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the steep declines we're seeing in birds and other species, are, it's really important to pay attention to because they're signaling to us that many of the practices that we've considered standard, you know, or traditional ways of operating, they're just no longer sustainable um, today. And an unsustainable supply chain, of course, is not going to be resilient to climate change or a variety of other stressors, you know, that are either happening now or we expect to, you know, worsen in the future. And so we have, I think, the opportunity to really harness the power of birds, you know, and to use them to build stronger and more resilient supply chains, you know, through monitoring, through helping to really guide strategic interventions and actions. And so we can together then, you know, try to ensure that those supply chains are sustainable and really are providing for, for us now and also future generations, you know, that we all depend on the same healthy environment and birds can help us get there, you know, by providing a new lens that we can really get the most critical information we need to make the right decisions. 
I love that. And so with these new tools, with these new ways of being able to utilize existing information, we can really start to, I think, move the needle, not only to have resilient supply chains, but also to conserve um, these beautiful species because they really do have a unique function in, in the ecosystem as well as they're just incredible to, to look at. And so we wanna preserve those for the next generations to be able to enjoy and study um, the way you and I have. And so with that, Amanda, I don't know if you have any closing remarks, um, but this has been a really great um, dialogue and really appreciate your, your insights into how businesses can help uh, Thank you. Help yeah, I've really enjoyed um, visiting with you today. And yeah, again, it's, uh, it's an honor to be a part of the summit. So thank you. Thank you. And we can hang on here for a few minutes. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and just ask us anything you want. Any questions from our audience? This right. is Nolan Kuros from Costa Rica, maybe just before, really quick. Hi, Nolan. How are you, Christine? I'm very good. How are you? Fine, thank you, Amanda. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. And you know, living in Costa Rica is kind of like just looking at what you are saying, but I was thinking in the terms of how these communities and supply can actually interact. And I was thinking that we receive a lot of migratory birds actually from you. And so how can we actually even start making these communities to be actually work communities? Because it will be so great to have our communities here in Costa Rica to communicate with supply chains that also benefit from the same birds that we receive here during your winter and that are, you know, our birds for three months and then they become the birds of the whole two countries. Right, you know, you know it's really interesting, Nolan, that they're really technically a lot of our migratory birds are more your birds than ours. So a lot of our research with eBird shows that a lot of our neotropical migratory birds are actually spending more of the year in Latin America than they are in the breeding season. So yeah, it's actually reversed, so go figure. But um, yeah, it's true that there are a lot of these migratory birds that, you know, and that can actually provide some additional resources because there are, um, there are grants from agencies, you know, government agencies and NGOs that are also um, intended to support some of the migratory birds that can of course protect the same sort of habitats and, and help to, put in the same the kinds of practices that are also beneficial for a lot of the resident species. Um, so yeah, and I see a little sign that we're probably, the session will cut off soon. So just wanna note, folks can definitely reach out um, for us. But yeah, Nolan, in Costa Rica, we're right now working with Ecom and Espresso as well to develop um, biodiversity indicators that can be used to track sort of the health of, um, you know, different coffee habitats for resident and migratory birds. Um, so, I mean, you're right, there's so much opportunity to be working together and use birds really as ambassadors in a way, um, you know, to work across um, country lines. It's a great question. And I love the, just the visual in my mind of being able to connect the supply chain. I think that's where the mapping really comes in. You know, what are these connections to your supply chain and where are the ge geographies that you're sourcing from and what mm -hmm. birds are in those regions and what can we do, you know, what can corporate yeah, like to collaborative investment do to really secure those supply chains, which would also be beneficial for birds. And so I love that. Yeah. Kind of the mapping piece, I think, is really critical, knowing where your supply chains are. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I see a couple of questions in the chat, um, Kevin and Allison. Um, so I think with the citizen science, that can be used in a way to make that connection to farm or, you know, even more like kind of landscape where it might bring together maybe like in the case of cooperatives or where you have multiple farms that are contributing to a supply chain in a region. And so that can work either by, you know, the models that we're creating with the data assets we already have, you know, that can actually predict what should the community be? You know, what would a complete community be that so it could provide a baseline in a way that that um, could be used to really track the impact of different practices, but it's also a way to engage local communities. So a lot of countries, especially in Latin America now, have really realized that Bird-related tourism is, a, is an opportunity to really support rural communities and help diversify livelihoods in some of these regions. And so, you know, we're seeing there can be um, sometimes a way to engage, you know, bird watchers during their tours who might be able to collect information, um, you know, in some of the data along in regions where people are sourcing or local birding groups or local schools. Um, you know, so those um, individuals can be trained to actually do bird surveys. You know, so that's one way. We do work with organizations to develop monitoring protocols. They're really driven by community needs and interests. And so that's, that is certainly one, one strategy. Another way is to integrate like with acoustic monitoring. So it's possible to put out recording, small recording units that can collect, you know, large amounts of data on species that are present. The trick is to actually extract those data and make them useful, right? You can imagine with all those hours and hours of recording, but we're doing this now. And this is actually um, the project with Nespresso and Ecom and the Cornell Lab is, you know, we're working to try to develop software that can better extract the information on birds um, from those recordings. So that's another, um, another way that we can use sort of citizen science and these other um, new technologies to try to understand what's happening on the farms and within those working landscapes. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. I think we've come to the end of our time, but for, for those of you who are still on, please reach out if you have more questions. I love the tool she just described. It's artificial intelligence, it's learning bird song and really, you know, being able to do things in, in, in a way that just the human ear couldn't do. And so being able to use these technologies in your supply chains is just an incredible opportunity. So please do reach out to us if you have any questions. And um, thank you so much for attending the session today. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.